Well, Bill McKibben, welcome to The Elephant. It's very good to be with you. Uh, now, this is uh, our inaugural episode, actually. We're going to be doing a series looking at various facets of climate change, some of the battles going on, uh, some of the effects, uh, and basically just delving into different areas of the issue. It's a really big one. Um, but what I wanted to do with you specifically before we, in the series, get into all these different chapters was to talk about a, a bit about the the movement, that where we're at in terms of the social fight uh, to do something about climate change, because you've been front and central in that. Now, you wrote uh, not too long ago in The Guardian, um, something along the lines of, it's not as if we're winning the climate fight, but we're not losing it the way we used to. Could, could you tell me what you mean by that? Sure. Well, you need to remember that I've been at this a long time. I wrote the first book about what we now call climate change, what we then called the greenhouse effect, it came out 1989. So I've had a long time to kind of watch the ebb and flow of this fight. And for most of that time, um, we've really gotten nowhere. I mean, there have been a few exceptions. Uh, a couple of countries that have taken this issue seriously and um, demonstrated some of what can be done. Germany is probably the best example, and Scandinavia. But for the most part around the world, uh, carbon emissions have just kept steadily climbing at an accelerating pace, and our governments have done little or nothing. Uh, the U.S., where I live, has had a you know 25 year bipartisan effort to accomplish nothing which has been entirely successful um for a long time we thought that the reason for that was that we needed to uh keep winning the argument that we'd already won the scientific argument about climate change by 1995 or so the world scientists were in firm agreement that this was a terrible problem that uh was going to cause the greatest crisis human beings have yet faced. Um, and people kept going to our legislators around the world and telling them that and getting nowhere. Um, so at a certain point, some of us began to understand that it was less about uh, winning the argument and more about winning the fight. And that the reason that we were losing was that there was another side to this fight, and that side was the richest industry on earth, the fossil fuel industry and that their money and hence their political power had been sufficient to make sure that we uh, never changed. And that's when we began really starting to organize. We knew we'd never outspend the fossil fuel industry. They are, as I say, the richest agglomeration in human history. So we had to find different currencies to work in, and, and the only ones available were the currencies of movements, you know, passion, spirit, creativity. Uh, sometimes the willingness to spend our own bodies. And so that's what we have begun to do in many forms and guises and organizations around the world. Uh, 350.org, which I helped found, is maybe the best global example, but there are people everywhere in this fossil fuel resistance. And their work uh, has, at this point, um, begun to really tell on the fossil fuel industry. Every new plan for expansion is challenged, fought, delayed, in many cases beaten. Um, the cost of doing business goes up and up and up. More to the point, uh, people working on projects like fossil fuel divestment have been able to get across the essential truth about uh, our predicament that the fossil fuel industry has five times as much carbon in its reserves as any scientist thinks we can safely burn. And that's been enough to begin delegitimizing this industry, not just with environmentalists, but there are now warnings coming from the World Bank and the Bank of England and, and a thousand other places about this carbon bubble. Could you, could you just explain that for a second? Like the math behind your article in Rolling Stone and the fact that we can't burn what the oil companies say they currently have in reserve? Yeah, yeah. sure. Absolutely. Um, it's a just basic, simple problem in mathematics, you know. Um, scientists know about how much more carbon we can burn to keep us from going past a temperature increase of greater than 2 degrees Celsius, which the world has agreed, the only thing the world ever agreed about climate change was that that was the red line that we wouldn't go past. We can burn, you know, on the order of 500 gigatons more carbon um, and stay below that 2 degree level. The problem is the fossil fuel industry has like 2,800 gigatons worth of carbon in their bank already, all the coal and gas and oil that they've discovered and announced they're going to burn. And 
um, I, if they carry out their business plan, the planet tanks. Uh, this is obviously bad for for environmental reasons, like we've only got one planet. And it's also bad for financial reasons. It's a bubble, in other words, like, say, the housing bubble that helped bring down the world economy in 2008. There's more houses than there were more houses than people needed in parts of the world where they loaned huge amounts of money to build them. And so their value began to fall. If we ever decide to try and meet that two degree temperature target, then you have to cut the valuations of these fossil fuel companies in half. That's why they work so hard to make sure that we never will do anything about climate change. But that's, you know, that's those things, this constant protest, this delegitimization, those would present difficult but manageable problems for the fossil fuel industry were there not something else also going on on the planet. And that is the absolutely breathtaking fall in the price of solar panels. Uh, they've fallen 75% in the last six years, 98% in the last 40 years. Uh, they're now a commodity item. They're in many places in the world the cheapest way of generating electricity. Uh, electricity that, among other things, we can increasingly use to drive cars if we need to drive cars. Um, and what that means is that uh, the fossil fuel industry is being undercut from the other side, too. Uh, we've got them in a kind of pincers uh, movement and that's a good thing because they are a um, uh, they're they're bad news uh, operation the fossil fuel industry now something i've heard you talk about uh about the sort of movement before uh the past few years where it's become more active was the sense that it was about light bulbs it was about making these small consumer decisions rather than what you've said it's about now is about power Yes, that's right. You know, so for a long time, environmentalists focused on small things that ordinary people could do, which was entirely okay. I mean, the roof of my house is covered in solar panels. I drove the first hybrid electric Ford in the state of Vermont. Um, I'm all for making those kind of changes. But I also try not to fool myself that that's how we're going to stop climate change in the time that physics has provided us. Now, climate change is a structural, systemic problem. It's rooted in the power of the fossil fuel industry, above all in their ability to avoid having to pay the cost that carbon exacts on the environment. Uh, they get to pollute for free. And so any answer to climate change that is going to matter in terms of the time that we have is also going to be structural and systemic. That means changing senators, not light bulbs. Um, it means changing the rules under which we operate, not how we operate within those rules. Uh, I always tell people that you know the three things you need to do are one, organize, two, get together with your neighbors and organize, you know, three, uh, go right on Facebook and do some organizing there, two, and four, if you've got some time left over, then by all means, change your light bulbs. We set up groups like 350.org in order to make that organizing accessible and easy for people all over the world. And we've been successful. We think we've organized about 20,000 demonstrations in every country on Earth except North Korea. I mean, one of the interesting problems, I think, that comes with that, that previous mentality that I think was dominant, that it was just about making our own individual behaviors, and that should be the focus of most of our energies, was that in a way... Um, as you said, you can't really live in the world and not be full of contradictions in the, in the world that fossil fuels built. And so there was always a sense that there's nothing enough you could do. And then your efforts always were so individual. You, they would never seem to be growing in any sense. Yes, I think that that's just right. Um, you know, we live in the world that we're trying to change. Um, I, I've flown more than I would like to in the last uh seven years as we're building 350.org, for instance. Um, I offset my flights by paying carbon credits and things, but I don't fool myself that it actually means very much. Uh, I do humor myself with the notion that the movement that we're building is um, uh, worth the carbon, worth, worth the pain of you know climbing into yet another airplane and going off to yet another place to give yet another talk. 
Could you talk about the current uh, action specifically? Like how, one of the, the two main ones, I suppose, the main actions that you and 350.org have um, been associated with is the fight against the Keystone XL and the divestment movement. Could you just talk a bit about those, like um, maybe the Keystone first? How did, how did that come about? Well, the Keystone pipeline fight is, we're actually fighting bad, dirty energy infrastructure projects all over the world and of every kind, you know, big coal mines in Australia, coal ports on the northwest of the United States, uh, fracking across Europe, you name it. But um, the Keystone became the most famous fight in certain sense because uh, it was early and in another sense because it intersected with U.S. presidential politics and so everyone was paying attention. In 2011, Jim Hansen at NASA, the greatest climatologist in the world, put out a little paper saying people might want to pay attention to these uh, tar sands up in Canada because they have so much carbon in them that if we pumped all the economically recoverable oil out of there, uh, it would make it impossible to uh, ever balance the planet's climate books. It would, as he put it, be game over for the climate. Same is true of you know the Galilee Basin in Australia, the huge coal mine, or uh, the tar sands of Venezuela or a bunch of other places. But this one, uh, you know, they were trying to build the first really big pipeline out of it, and they needed a presidential permit. And though everyone told us we had no real chance of winning, we decided we'd give it a shot. Um, and so far, this coalition of activists and scientists and ranchers and farmers, and especially indigenous people, First Nations people, have managed to hold their own. And it's been kind of beautiful to see. It involved at the beginning the largest civil disobedience action about anything in the United States for about 30 years. And those 1,200 people who went to jail were able to start reframing this debate for the moral question that it should be. Four years on, the pipeline's still not built. We don't know how it's all going to come out, but um, we've kept 800,000 barrels of oil at the dirtiest oil in the world in the ground every day for the last four years, so worth a few nights in jail. And and what about the divestment movement? Could you tell me about how that came about? Yeah, the divestment movement really um, grew out of this article I wrote for Rolling Stone about that new math of climate change that I was describing before, the fact that these companies have five times as much carbon in their reserves as we can afford to burn. And once you know that, then these become rogue companies, not normal companies. Um, we have to prevent them from carrying out their business plan. And so as with apartheid in South Africa 30 years ago, one of the ways to do that, to try and break their power, is to get valued institutions to withdraw their imprimatur from these groups, to stop investing in them, to say that they're off limits and out of bounds. And so far that's been very successful. Oxford University says it's the fastest growing anti-corporate campaign of its type ever. Um, and, you know, as I said before, it's already taken this issue of stranded assets and the carbon bubble and stuff and injected it into the middle of the conventional wisdom. It's not me and Rolling Stone now. It's people in, you know, the World Bank and, and the Bank of England and whatever. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is so many places have decided to join in and divest. Some of them colleges and universities and states and places like Stanford uh, or around the world, uh, Sydney, uh, Scotland, where Glasgow has divested, uh, and now Edinburgh, um, many places around the world, lots and lots of religious groups, the World Council of Churches, the United Church of Christ, but also places that one might not have initially expected. Maybe the most important moment so far in this fight came in September the same day that we had 400,000 people marching through the streets in New York, that evening, the Rockefeller family announced that they were divesting all their philanthropic institutions from fossil fuel. And the first family of fossil fuel announced that it no longer thought it was moral or prudent to be invested in this stuff. And that was, um, that was an amazing moment. I think in a way, that moment marked the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel age. And the question is whether we can bring it to an end before we do absolutely impossible damage to the earth or not. And that remains an open question. Uh, you know, I know more than I would like to about the science of this stuff, really. 
it occurs to me that it's such a, a smart way to go about doing it because it, it gives the one thing that the climate change fight has otherwise lacked, which is sort of incremental wins that you can point to and say, we, we, we've accomplished something, we've done this. That's right. And it allows people everywhere, even if they don't have a pipeline through their neighborhood or a coal mine uh, down the road, it allows them to play a very useful and important part in this fight. And you've also recently teamed up in a way with The Guardian in, in this fight. Can you tell me about how that happened? Yeah, The Guardian is an amazing operation. I got to say, I, I have a few institutions I now admire more on earth. Um, Alan Rusbridger, the editor, uh, is, uh, you know, probably the great newspaper editor in the English speaking world. And I, I met him when he was getting an award in Sweden last November, this so called Right Livelihood Award or the Alternative Nobel Prize. Um, from the Swedish parliament. And as it turns out, they were giving me one of these things too. So we got to have uh, lunch together and we spent the whole time talking. Uh, uh, he was getting ready to retire. And as he was going out, he wanted to do uh, something that addressed this greatest of all problems, climate change. And so he's brought the full power of the Guardian to bear on this issue. They're reporting day in and day out now on the depredations of the oil companies, on the vacillations of the politicians on the impossibilities of this movement. They've been running a campaign to get the Welcome Trust, a huge medical charity in the UK, and the Gates Foundation, the mammoth uh, medical charity in the US to divest their holdings in fossil fuels for the obvious reason that climate change is making people very sick very fast. Um, um, it's been beautiful to watch. They're uh, an amazing, amazing outfit, and he's a remarkable man. One of the things I find most interesting about your story is that uh, you're sort of a, a reluctant public figure. Uh, you've you talked about how, you know, you're a writer, you're, most writers are naturally shy, they wouldn't want to be in the spotlight. And it seems like you've, through just seeing the current situation, have felt like there's no other choice but to, to get more involved, to get more active. Can you tell me about how that transition like happened? Like when, when did you start to realize that you would personally have to sort of put yourself out there? Just over time, and I was, you know, it's not my thing, but, you know, over time it just becomes clear. I remember going to Bangladesh when they were having their first big outbreak of dengue fever, a mosquito-borne disease that's spreading like wildfires, the climate warms, and watching everybody get sick from this thing. And I eventually, I was spending a lot of time in the slums, so I got bit by the wrong mosquito, and I got sick myself, as sick as I've ever been. But I didn't die. I mean, I was strong and healthy going in. But I watched a lot of other people who were dying. And just reflecting on the incredible unfairness of it all. I mean, you know, if you measure the carbon footprint of the um, 180 million people in Bangladesh, you can't even really get a number. I mean, it's just a rounding error. They use so little fossil fuel. You know, whereas my country is the, <clears throat> by far the biggest historical contributor to climate change. And, you know, that was one of those things that just reminds one that it's time to actually um, do more than write another book, which I think at this point is clear, will not move the needle sufficiently. But I'd be happy to go back to doing it. And happily, there's more and more and more people now who are capable of doing this movement stuff and doing it better than I am, you know. Um, so that's good. And uh, uh, I, I'm... Uh, very happy to seed the field to them. Was it actually that much of a turning uh, moment? Like, um, w was it actually when you were sick uh, no, with I mean, a fever? That, or I, is I, that... I never move in, you know, it's, I mean, I'm not a good Hollywood character in any way, beginning with the fact that I'm not very handsome. <laughs> um, um, no, but that's just, I mean, for me in my mind, that's a useful shorthand for sort of remembering this sort of transition and how it happened. I mean, one of the most interesting and, I guess, for me, despairing uh, battlegrounds in the climate fight is is Congress, and I think it illustrates uh, so well how it's it's all about power too. Uh, you you said that uh, what I never could have predicted was that one entire political party was going to give itself over to climate change denial. W what do you think happened? Like, uh, climate change used to at least have um, some semblance of being a bipartisan issue. Oh well, I mean it's. 
very simple. The fossil fuel industry just purchased one political party and terrified the other one. I mean, the Koch brothers, who are the richest man on earth taken together, um, are going to spend $900 million on the next federal election. They're going to spend more money than the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, the Koch brothers party of two. Um, that money will all go to Republicans. They call the tune. So if they say that we're going to deny the existence of climate change and prevent anything from happening, then they win. I mean, for me, it's so scary because, uh, I mean, for I'm sure everyone, it's so scary because uh, the United States is such a big player. And so really it comes down to, I mean, a huge part of the fight comes down to who's who gets elected to Senate and who gets elected to the White That's House. That's correct. Right? That's correct. But, uh, you know, what, I mean, the Democrats really didn't do very much when they ran things either. Um, some of them are bought, but more of them are just terrified by the fossil fuel industry. Um, so we have to figure out ways to work around the fact that uh, Congress is inert. And increasingly, we can do that. And one of the good things of the moment is the rapidly falling price of solar panels <clears throat> rechanges, rejiggers the game in certain ways and to our advantage. Um, and at any rate, even the Republicans, even where it can't stand up to a change in the basic zeitgeist of the country or the planet. That's what movements really are best at doing. We've watched it with gay marriage, you know. Um, once a movement sprung up that changed how people thought about it, uh, now even the Republicans are all eager to show that they're not bigots anymore and so on. Um, that's what's beginning to happen here with climate change. It'll be harder because there's way more money on the other side than there was in something like gay marriage. But it's, uh, on the other hand, We've got the greatest single educator there is, Mother Nature, working to illustrate our folly day in and day out. And with each passing week, more people get the message. I mean, California is in a drought so deep that it will not come out of it the same place that it was before. Uh, and that helps people understand what the stakes are. I mean, for so long, climate change was uh, such a hard issue because it seemed like it was, or it was talked about something that would be coming in decades, you know, like we could something we could worry about for a while and then go on with our regular lives. But now, and it, it's just in the past few years, it seems like it's really put itself front and center. Yes, that's true. You know, the physics of it are inexorable and there's the heat that's already been trapped in the atmosphere uh, is expressing itself in an enormous number of mischievous ways that are uh, causing huge and horrific pain for people around the world, especially the poorest people who have done the least to cause the problem that we face. That's all exactly correct. And uh, it is a shame that we didn't. Um, I mean, it would have been nice if uh, everybody had read my book 26 years ago and said, oh, okay, let's, let's solve this problem now. It would have been fundamentally much easier to solve 26 years ago. But that's not really how human beings change. Books are important, but not decisive. Um, you know, we often need to wait to see at least the beginnings of the consequences and then to build the movements that react to those. Do you have, I'd be curious to hear about your own personal journey. I mean, because you wrote uh, The End of Nature, what was it in 1989? It came out in 89, so I wrote it in 87 and 88, I guess. I mean, it must feel so strange in a way to have been talking about this uh, for so long and to have been thinking about it for so long and, and for the start being relatively uh, alone or for huge swaths kind of uh, thinking about yes. it on your own. What was that like? Well, yes, there was some of that feeling of that you get when you have a nightmare and you're trying in the nightmare to alert everybody else around you to this, you know, horrible creature that's charging down the street or something and you can't make yourself heard um there was some of that i mean not that i can complain the book was came out in 24 languages and was a bestseller in many of them and so on um but it didn't you know and no book ever does um, um by itself change uh the equation especially when there's this much money at stake um, but it did help one of the many things that helped at least bring the debate into being 
and um, on we've gone. Um, I, I, I wish that I'd known earlier on that it was going to take sort of movement building to to carry the day. I kind of kicked myself for not figuring that out sooner and going to work sooner. But it's possible that the ground wouldn't have been ripe sooner for this kind of work. I heard you say you, you were left feeling, I mean, understandably, really depressed after after writing that book and for sort of like a couple of years we're in a, in a funk. Yes, living with the science and stuff for a couple of years was is very depressing. And if I have an advantage at this point is that I've gotten through most of my angst about it all and now just wake up wondering what I can do each day to, to work on it. And um, I've accepted that we're going to be some bad damage done and accept it also that we can uh, if we fight keep it from being any worse than it needs to get was was coming to that terms i mean basically having to write off the the sense of stability that that i guess we once had that like things are okay or will continue to be okay oh absolutely i mean i think that that's one of the i think you put your finger on one of the great losses uh you know, one of the things that is really psychologically helpful for human beings is a sense of stability and security. And there's always been a kind of, even amidst the kind of chaos of the 20th century, uh, there's, you know, the incredible upheaval and change and things, the new technologies and new ideologies and things rot in people's lives. There was at least the background physical stability of the planet to count on, you know, as long as we've known this planet, the, the Holocene, the last 10,000 years, um, the temperature and hence the, the its operations have been remarkably stable. If your grandfather, grandmother could grow corn in a certain field, then you know your granddaughter would be able to as well. But that's now a sucker's bet. Um, you know, all bets are off in, in that kind of way. And I think that that's a very, very new and difficult position for humans to be in. I think it's one of the things that's most debilitating about climate change, truthfully. Yeah, because for me personally, I've found that like one of the biggest problems in, in uh, to confront it, because for so long I would have even avoid reading about it in the newspaper, is that basically having to admit to myself how much has been lost, how like how all the guiding assumptions that I was brought up with that like, oh, I can have a career, or I can pursue various goals, all suddenly I have to almost throw that that all away um, and all those assumptions away, which was, uh, for me, very, well, very difficult. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't go completely overboard. Um, you know, we need, we need people pursuing their careers and doing them well, and an awful lot of them now intersect with this fight. What we need is to understand that our civilization needs to take as the lens through which it views the world no longer a kind of fixation on economic growth, but now a kind of fixation on survivability and sustainability. And just take people from every profession doing that, more it'll take everyone after hours and on weekends behaving like citizens, you know, taking part in the in the kind of movements we need to, to make these things happen. But I'm not... Um, I'm not despairing, as we said at the beginning. Um, we're obviously going to see a lot of damage. Uh, the world is going to be a different and lesser place. It already is. But um, we're also beginning to rise to the occasion and demonstrating not just the dangers, but the usefulness of the uh, large brain uh, and perhaps large hearts that we have. So it'll be a very fascinating and interesting next few decades, too. <laughs> yeah, that, that's for sure. Um, I mean, you you work a lot with with young people, with students, uh, especially in, in the divestment campaign. And I'm curious, what have you, what, what thoughts have you come away with um, seeing them as they're just about to embark into the world based on this this new context? Yeah, I mean, I work entirely almost with young people. We've I founded 350.org with myself and seven college undergraduates. And I confess I don't really think of them very often as young people. They're just, you know, colleagues. Um, but they do possess some great skills that are particularly useful here. People who grew up, unlike me, in the age of the Internet have a visceral sense of connection that allows them to organize very easily um, and... I think allows them a uh, intuitive sense of the kind of architecture of the world towards which we're headed. 
an architecture where energy comes from uh, many sources at once. It's what the engineers would call distributed generation. You know, solar panels on 10 million rooftops all interconnected. If you think about it, that looks a lot like the internet. Um, look, young people are scared and worried about all this as they should be. They're going to have, I'm going to be, you know, dead in 20 years. So I will have uh, gotten to live much of my life in a world not completely discombobulated by climate change. But if we go down the path we're currently on, that won't be true of today's young people. They'll be in the prime of their careers dealing with this dislocation on a massive scale. So it's appropriate that, that they're in the forefront of this fight around the world. Uh, I, I think they're, that's one of the things that gives me great hope, the power that, with which they pursue it and uh, the clear-headedness with which they go after it. They're not trying to change every aspect of the culture in which we live uh, in the kind of fashion of people in the 60s. They're trying to stand up to power and uh, economic power especially, and reshape that part of the world in a way that works. I mean, look, people in the 60s did an awful lot of the cultural and social work that we needed, and it frees us up to deal with the physics. I think one of the more, at least theoretically beneficial things about climate change in terms of confronting it is that, you know, it, it unites all of us, even you know, even the wealthy live in New York, even even the wealthy are, are um, going to be threatened by rising waters or by drought. That's right. They don't call it global warming for nothing. That's very true. Has there been any examples in the work uh, you've been doing or in, with 350.org uh, where you've seen unlikely alliances that have, have kind of given you hope? Well, we sort of build these alliances all over the world. We'll do these days of action and they'll be, you know, 5,000, 6,000 simultaneous demonstrations from, you know, deep in the Maasai uh, artland in Kenya to, you know, in the middle of Fifth Avenue. And everybody feels as if they're part of the same operation. They have the same message, the same understanding of where we need to go. Um, they're using the same numbers and images. It's very powerful. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, <laughs> Too much of the 1% is tied up in this, you know, fantasy of continuing to plunder the world for another generation or two. But um, uh, for the rest of us, uh, you know, I think it's really powerful to begin to see those bonds building. In relation to your thoughts on how the fight over climate change is, is largely about power, you've also written a lot of interesting things about how it's, it's about creating pressure. And I was, I was hoping you could talk about that because, you know, with, with for example, the, the climate march in New York uh, that you helped organize and all these various actions, I mean, I guess the goal is to, is to create pressure, right? But often, often that can be quite invisible. I, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily the, the very next day lead to, to something. C could you talk about, um, I guess, just the sense of building pressure and, and what's behind that? Yeah, I mean, that's just what movements do. You know, that's the... That's the point. Constant pressure applied everywhere. I mean, you never know quite where it's all going to break out and pay off. Um, but it does in all kinds of ways. Look, we, you know, uh, uh, last week, Prince Charles announced that he was divesting his holdings from fossil fuels. I would not have been one of the places I would have predicted that <laughs> this would work. Um, but um, there you go. That's if you build a big enough movement, good things start to happen. Were there any particular examples you learned from in, in learning about movements? Because you, you've said you were, you were learning as you went. Yeah, sure. We've looked a lot at, you know, I mean, we're Americans, so we, you know, I'm American, so I think about the civil rights movement a lot. That was our, but, uh, you know, it's clear that the 20th century, the great technology of the 20th century was nonviolent civil disobedience. That Gandhi and King and many others were really on to something, and we haven't paid it enough attention you know, it doesn't mean that we go get arrested every day, but it means that we build movements that uh, uh, take advantage of um, all those lessons from the 20th century. And I would, uh, I mean, to, to draw the point more finally, are there any specific lessons you learned, either from like their victories or from, from their setbacks? Like, is there anything you could point to as something you took away from that? 
Um, well, just that um, there are moments when you have to use your body to underline the urgency uh, and the moral importance of the question at hand. No one had heard of the Keystone Pipeline, and so it was a good thing that we went and chained ourselves to the White House gate as uh, Cornel West, the great philosopher and public intellectual, said last week at Harvard when we were doing this divestment work, he said, this is uh, our planetary Selma. This is our lunch counter moment for the century. So that's, you know, I think that there's something to that. One of the things I think is a uh, sort of uh, might prevent some people from getting more viscerally involved in, in that sort of way is this sort of intangible sense that, oh, I'm just not the type of person to be uh, a rabble rouser, to be um, uh, get ar arrested. And I, I'm imagining that's part of, you know, I'm, I'm sure you never thought you'd be getting arrested either. Yeah, I never did. But it's also fine. There's We don't need everybody getting arrested. There's all kinds of people with different skills and whatever, and good movements make use of all of them. So, and we don't, you know, most of the time, I mean, I, you know, uh, long periods of time go by without me getting arrested, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> I'm in no great hurry to. Uh, just every once in a while, it's part of the toolkit, you know. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about Paris. I mean, uh, later this year, we're coming up on uh, the UN-sponsored climate change conference in, in Paris, sort of the follow-up from Copenhagen. Um, what, do, what do you see as either the, the meaning or non-meaning um, of, of that? Like how, how much weight are you putting into Paris? Well, Copenhagen was obviously a complete disaster and fiasco, the worst diplomatic failure since in Munich. Nothing happened because there was no movement on the ground in any of these countries to, I mean, by itself, the UN process is meaningless. It's just a reflection of uh, how much work and pressure there is back home on these governments. And so, you know, in the intervening five years, we've built big movements around the world. I think Paris will go better than Copenhagen. I don't think it will solve the problem. I think it's one step along the way. I think the most important question to be solved there is whether we can find sufficient financing in the rich world to allow the poor world to leapfrog fossil fuel and go straight to renewable energy. That's the thing that I'm going to be most focused on when I'm there. And, I, you know, Hillary Clinton promised $100 billion a year from the rich nations to the poor at Copenhagen. She's probably in the position to deliver that as we head into Paris. We'll see if she does or not. And can you just explain, like, what what exactly is going to be happening at Paris? Lots of countries around the world meeting to come up with some yet another agreement on what to do about climate change. It's not going to be a binding agreement, so it shouldn't be that hard of <laughs> negotiation. Um, they're basically just showing up to promise things, and um, nobody's signing on any dotted line, really. Um, so it's in many ways a step backward in ambition from where we were in the past, but um, that's that's what's going on. And uh, as I say, the the other thing that's happened in the intervening five years is that renewable power got cheap, and that's bound to have some effect on how people play their hand. Uh, whatever happens in Paris, you know, we'll need for many, many years to come a movement that's pushing ever harder uh, because it's not going to come anywhere near the scale or pace of action we need to hold climate change to a um, workable level. And can you tell me about what happened in Copenhagen? There was a lot of hopes around that. Well, I, none of them were mine. I didn't. I thought Copenhagen would be a failure from the start for precisely the reasons I've said. I mean, nobody does anything for free. Um, the fact that there's a, uh, uh, you know, that, that there's a horrible problem to be solved doesn't seem to motivate politicians to solve it. Um, only the fact that there's real pressure. Um, to do something motivates people. And now there's some pressure, so maybe Paris won't be as bad as Copenhagen, which was pretty bad. Now, through 350.org, uh, the movement has has uh, become, I mean, I guess it always was, but it has become even more uh, obviously global. Are there any examples from, from outside of America that, that you've been following that, have, that you felt inspired by? Oh, hell, the, I mean, we've been global from the start, and the, most of the best organizing is going on in other places. I mean, 
you know, last fall while people were marching in New York, our teams across the Pacific were building uh, traditional canoes on, you know, 12 of those islands that nations that may disappear this century, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, uh, they took those canoes and used them to blockade the largest coal port in the world in Australia. It was a powerful, magnificent uh, symbolic blow against the biggest coal exporter in the world and a huge help in this fight to reorient Australia from a carbon villain into a country that makes use of its um, enormous reserves of sun and wind and tide and all the things that should be uh, powering its future. Um, you know, the same kind of thing going on in every corner of the planet. Amazing organizing in uh, Southern Africa to move people straight to renewable energy. Amazing organizing in India to block the rise of coal power and spread renewables as fast as can be. Uh, it's beautiful to watch all over the planet. I'm sure you get this question a lot, but um, for for individuals, especially uh, like you were saying, like obviously people need normal jobs. Uh, ordinary people uh, need to be involved as as much as sort of um, people who de dedicate themselves to the cause full time. But for those who who don't exactly know uh, how they fit in, who have maybe had that uh, feeling, oh, I changed my light bulbs. What more can I do? Um, what what would your message uh, be after after the past few years of your work? Well, this is the right place to end. I mean, uh, the the message is, uh, as an individual, you're basically powerless against climate change. So our job is to become, you know, the most important thing an individual can do is not be an individual. It's to join together with other people. That's why we set up 350.org, and um, that's why so many other people are organizing, and that's why if we win, we're going to win. Um, so now is the moment if you've been keeping your powder dry for some reason, now is the moment for the fight. And, and, and just to my final question, I mean, since you jumped in with both feet, uh, with launching 350.org, um, is there anything that, that surprised you, you most, uh, about the, the, the fight around climate change? Um, the fact that, uh, once we started organizing we started winning some um and it's a good reminder that uh, the other side looks all powerful until you begin to um until you begin to push and then if you push hard enough you got a chance uh no guarantees we're going to win but there is a guarantee now we're going to fight and that's really good well, uh, Bill McKibben, uh, I really appreciate uh, all the, the work you've personally done on, on this issue and through uh, 350.org, and I uh, uh, really appreciate you uh, joining us today. Uh, thanks so much for... Back at you, brother. Show. Thank you for your good work, and, uh, and keep it up, and we'll see you in Paris. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Fantastic. Okay, bye. <laughs>